today. Uh, I, as I, uh, my introduction stated, I'm with the San Joaquin River Restoration Program, which is a, a joint effort. Um, we have multiple agencies uh, involved with that, from uh, state and federal, as well as working with the, um, the parties that uh, led us to uh, the settlement um, and others in the area to try to, to implement the restoration of this river. Um, just so we know where we're talking about when I say the San Joaquin River, it, it can mean a lot of things, but I'm talking specifically about the restoration area of the San Joaquin program. And, and that goes, uh, by, uh, we define that area as going from uh, up by Fryant Dam at Millichen Lake all the way down to the confluence with the Merced. Uh, the river itself is pretty interesting in that, um, hold on. Aha. So, um, quite a diversity of habitats within the system as it exists right now today. Um, up by uh, uh, Fryant Dam, we have some cool water that exists up there. Um, we can manipulate the temperatures up there to control them to provide some decent habitat. Um, and there's a, essentially a gravel and rocky bed up there. Whereas you get down in the lower river, it slows down, it widens out quite a bit. Um, it's a long path down with uh, bypasses as well as the natural river channel. Um, and, and, but looking at the river from here uh, versus up here, it looks like a very different place. Now, uh, why are we restoring the river? This river hasn't functioned as a natural uh, river in quite a while ecologically. Um, this stretch here doo -doo -doo, um, is an area called Gravelly Ford, uh, which has essentially remained dry um, from uh, shortly after uh, Fryant Dam was built. Fryant Dam was completed in the 1940s and then a series of water diversions uh, went um, after that, and once those diversions were put in place, most of the water uh, from, from Millichen Lake was used for agriculture and diverted from the river itself. This stretch at Gravelly Ford is a 60-mile stretch that has been dry um, uh, for, except for during flood flows, um, since, um, since uh, shortly after uh, the mid-1940s, uh, 1950s, in that, that area there. Now that, that was the past, uh, and that's uh, how the river was operated. It was not a mistake, it was a plan. The river was uh, deliberately dammed and diverted to support the growing agriculture in the region. Um, and uh, that has been contested many times almost immediately after uh, the diversions were put into place. Uh, we went through, a, uh, most recently, a series of uh, litigation um, that started in 1988, and it took us 18 years to resolve that litigation. Um, the result in a settlement in 2006. The settlement actually uh, revolved around the finding by, uh, um, by the courts that the operators of the dam had to comply with the Department of Fish and Game Code to maintain healthy fish populations below, um, below the dam. It took another three years after the settlement was passed before the Restoration Act was passed uh, through Congress, which actually gives us the authority to implement the restoration of the San Joaquin River. Prior to 2009, though, activities did take place um, under uh, different authorities, knowing that the restoration was moving forward. So the, rest of the settlement itself and the, and the act has a lot of details in it. It, it, it calls out a lot of the specific projects. Um, there's a lot in it that, that certainly is not defined very well that's being resolved over time. But the bottom line and the bigger picture is that we're trying to restore uh, the San Joaquin River, and the big piece of that is getting flows from Bryant Dam to the confluence of the Merced River, something that has not been done consistently for a long time, um, other than when uh, Mother Nature gives us floodwaters to, to push down the river. Uh, part of this is a series of channel improvements uh, that will allow flow conveyance so we can get enough water down the system, uh, which has been quite problematic, and I'll touch on that in a little more detail. And then this largely resolves around, although the settlement touches upon a number of species, it, it, res it really is focused um, in a number of ways on, on directly in introducing uh, Chinook salmon back to the system, and in particular, spring Chinook salmon. Uh, this is uh, uh, low in the range for spring Chinook. Historically, it was a major spring Chinook uh, producer for the um, Central Valley. So we are really hoping that this major restoration project will allow flows to the river, will allow spring Chinook salmon to access habitat and, and produce once again. And then hopefully that will uh, lead to a, a more robust spring Chinook salmon population within, um, within California. And then uh, part of reintroducing salmon, of course, is uh, there's some very uh, specific channel improvements that are called out, but also we need to provide fish passage throughout the system and also build habitat that will allow us to meet population goals. So I feel a little bad after watching JD's talk because it's a lot of, and we did this, and we did that, 
and, and, and on the San Joaquin, I think we're making progress, but it, we're a long ways away from actually uh, even thinking about having fish return to the system or to have a river that we can say functions like a natural river or has a natural ecology to it. That said, we are making some progress, and I, and I think um, it's been eye-opening. I've been with the program for about six months now, and the amount of work it takes to make just these small steps that we've made and the amount of resistance um, that is encountered at every step in the process is pretty overwhelming. Um, so everything we do accomplish, maybe these within our big program here, these are the, some of the smaller bites that we're talking about. And every single one of those that we hit, I think we have to stop for a minute and appreciate where we are because we're a long way from where we were uh, prior to the litigation, uh, even though we have a long way to go. So just, I'm not going to get into, uh, there's a lot of work going on. There's a lot of people involved in the project across the agencies, but I'll just touch upon some of the things I think that we have uh, had some success with, success with and how far we're going. And, and a big piece of that is these major construction projects are an involved process for the federal government to lead the rebuilding of a river. Uh, it, it's quite an involved process and uh, it involves a lot of compliance, a lot of regulatory planning, as, as well as um, actual construction planning and project planning itself. Uh, we were able to get interim flows in the system and I'll, I'll touch upon that in a second. I think that's a, that's a historic uh, milestone for the program. And we're doing a lot of research, a lot of testing of the system and our methods that we will move forward to uh, reintroduce fish in the future, as well as improve our understanding of the system. Um, as I said before, it's been a long time since water's been pushed through the system for the purpose of providing any sort of natural, eco natural ecology. Um, so every um, piece of information we have is almost new information. And uh, from my background doing a lot of stock assessment work and that sort of thing, I've never I've never been so excited about single data points or just looking at, we do one study in one year, but that's the only information of any fish that's been in the system for a long time. And that's, that's pretty exciting and it's even my little brain can uh, understand some of those. Well, so this is a pretty busy graphic, right? But this just outlines some of the major projects that we have on the program that are coming forward. Um, the color codes on them are the red ones, uh, identify what are called phase one actions and they were spelled out specifically in the settlement. Uh, and then there's uh, the, the ones in yellow are called the phase two. But essentially, as you move from Friant Dam here, there's a number of, a number of impediments in the system uh, in addition to the fact that we haven't had flow continuity for a long time. So we have some gravel pits here right below Friant Dam where we think there's a potential for a lot of mortality. We have a series of bifurcation structures throughout the system at the, at the uh, confluences of the bypasses with the main river. Uh, all of those provide passage impediments for both fish moving upstream and, and downstream potentially, um, but additionally, uh, some of the contro actual control over the water isn't, isn't quite what it is uh, going to need to be to manage the system. We have some major passage barriers like Sac Dam right here, uh, which is believed to be an almost uh, complete fish passage barrier. We have a major site-specific project going in there to both uh, redo Sac Dam as well as screen off a Royal Canal to prevent losing fish, um, and then we're one of the major biggest projects for the program is to actually bypass Mendota Pool. Uh, Mendota Pool, for those of you who don't know, is a location on the San Joaquin that's, that's used as a central point for diverting water. Uh, I couldn't even begin to explain to you just how the Mendota Pool is managed. There's a lot of water coming into the system. There's a lot of water leaving the system. Uh, let's go forward. Uh, so these are the construction projects. We are making progress on these, but we have a long way to go. Uh, we're in the planning stages. Uh, we're multiple years into that. We're getting our permitting in place, and, and, um, and hopefully we'll start to see some dirt turning on these within the next couple of years. The interim flows that I referred to are pretty significant in my mind, and just to tell you what they are, essentially they're a phase in where we're releasing water into the system before we get to the full restoration flows that are supposed to occur in 2014. Um, 2009, we actually released fit, uh, water into the system for the first time, and here we see what used to be uh, the stretch of river that's been dry, and this is what it looks like when you put water in it. So uh, I don't know all the, the, there's a lot of details in terms of how we implement the projects and these construction projects, but I think it's pretty clear that we need to get water in the system and we need to get enough water in the system. So I think this is one of the first major milestones. First time water has been put in the system for the purpose of anything other than um, moving flood flows through the system in a very long time. We also have a series of studies that are going on that are telling us a lot about the system. I, I'm not, we have lots of different work because there's a lots of different information needs, but uh, one big piece is that we had a juvenile migration study and like putting water through the system for the first time, this study is significant because it was the first time we've had uh, uh, Chinook salmon, these were fall Chinook salmon, moving through the system and actually survived through the San Joaquin River. And actually in this study we also learned that 
uh, the fish can survive at a pretty high level of survival. Um, over half our fish from one uh, route trajectory did survive through the entire restoration area. Um, and what is, uh, but that was only a single year where we had extremely high flow. So in this coming year, we'll learn a little bit more under lower flow conditions how well the fish can survive. We've also identified spawning habitat, that there is spawning habitat up in the system, but we're, we're very likely going to be needing to do spawning gravel augmentation. And we've, and we've done some studies where we've shown that uh, eggs can actually survive in the system as well. Have a whole bunch of other studies going on focused on our reintroduction techniques as well as other <coughs> aspects of the program. Now, we're not without challenges in the program, and some of them are, are overwhelming. One is the delayed implementation uh, has caused a lot of angst over trying to meet the, the settlement guide timelines, but at the same time, um, implement the, the, the program in a stepwise fashion where we're pre creating the habitat and then, then introducing fish. And our flows have been constrained. Uh, we have a whole lot of other challenges in, in terms of dealing with downstream water users and, and resolving um, water uh, use and, and, uh, and the construction projects themselves and getting resistance to that. But the constrained flows are an extremely big uh, challenge for the program. And a big part of this is related to um, seepage. And essentially what happens when you have a system that hasn't had water for a long time, the program has a policy of essentially minimizing the impact to non-parties. And uh, w when you put water down the system, water in the river seeps out into the adjacent um, farmland or uh, privately owned properties and causes damage. It causes crop damage. Also, if the water can bring poor quality water, uh, water heavy in salts, to the ag land, which further reduces its quality. It's been a major program, uh, pro uh, project for the program. It is what is, uh, Right now, uh, both the seepage and levee stability is what is limiting our ability to put water down the system. So we have a pattern or trajectory where we're supposed to be releasing uh, interim flows and then restoration flows. And we're unable to do that at this time because of the seepage constraints as well as levee stability constraints. Oops, sorry. So what the program is doing is it's put in a large monitoring network, uh, which this shows all the wells that have been put in the system to monitor for groundwater levels so that we can manage seepage. Um, in addition to the monitoring network, we're also conducting uh, structural improvements and then working with the landowners of, of the impacted uh, uh, parcels. Some of those will be purchasing, some of those will be some mitigation. Um, others, uh, we're hoping uh, that, that our operations in the channel will reduce that impact. Uh, this has been, um, because it's such an important piece of the program and our ability to put water through the system, we're targeting these projects at, at flow levels so we can get enough uh, projects done where we can put three to 500 CF CFS down the system. Then we're going to try to put 700 down the system. And it's going to be a long uh, period of projects that need to be resolved as we move forward. Uh, so those are just a couple of the challenges or, or uh, and, and accomplishments we've had in the system. We have a long way to go. Our, we're looking towards 2025 is when we have to sort of summarize where we're at and report back to Congress. And in the future, we have a couple key milestones coming up. One is the construction of our conservation facility. We'll have a small-scale hatchery that doesn't have large mitigation responsibilities. It'll be focused solely on producing a self-sustaining population in the system. We hope to get full restoration flows within the next couple years as our seepage and levee stability constraints are resolved, as well as uh, resolving the passage uh, issues that we have in the system, both the major projects that have been identified, as well as others that we, we have been learning about through surveys in the system. And what we learned first uh, early in the program is that what, what we started off on and thought where our money was going to be focused has changed very quickly and uh, focusing on, on some of the landowner issues uh, as well as the permitting and the, the seepage constraints have, have been a, a large focus to the program that weren't anticipated to be that big a, a piece of the program. So try to keep uh, information as, as transparent as possible on the program. We have a website, uh, RestoreSJR.net, where you can link to a lot of updates in the program and what we have going on, as well as review our program documents. Um, and then you can also see that we have calendars there for a series of public meetings for people that are interested in participating and advising the program uh, in, 